with you once again, and dad gum, is debate season upon us or what? Woo! I mean to tell you, I think we're having another Republican debate every other day at this point. There's been two of them last week, and uh, I originally wanted to do this piece uh, talking about those debates in, in depth. The last two that we've had, there was one in a, uh, over the Ronald Reagan Library in California last week, and one just last night in Tampa uh, that was uh, supposedly a Tea Party debate. I was going to talk about those in depth and go through, okay, this candidate said this, and this candidate said that, and, you know, go through all the sound bites and everything, but I, I got to thinking, you know, really, in spite of all of these debates and all of the questions and all the answers and all of the applause lines and all of the uh, gaffes and everything else, really, nothing has changed as far as I'm concerned in terms of what I think of all the candidates. I'm still really in the same place I was a couple of weeks ago before these debates. Uh, Herman Cain is still my favorite candidate. Michelle Bachman's a close number two. Rick Perry is a distant number three. And beyond that, I'm not really interested in much of any of them. You know, uh, Rick Sandworm still strikes me as a guy who occasionally says the right thing, but seems a little bit too attached to the concept of a federal government as far as I'm concerned. You know, John Huntsman comes across to me as a guy who took a wrong turn and you know, meant to go into the Democratic Party's debate and end up in ours somehow. Don't ask me how that happened. Ron Paul seems like your crazy, nutty uncle who occasionally makes a good point, but then he starts talking about foreign policy and you realize he's nucking futz. And then Mitt Romney is pretty much the epitome of all that's evil at this point. So none of that has changed through these two debates. However, what I did find interesting and what I did want to talk about was a couple of moments within those two debates, a couple of moments really more of, of crowd reaction that lied with those debates than of what the candidates did or what the candidates said. Uh, a couple of pieces of crowd reaction that have gotten a lot of uh, attention in the media and uh, j just a lot of negative attention in the media actually. They've been very critical of Republicans and Tea Partiers for uh, some of the displays that we've seen. And no doubt you probably have seen in the media both of these situations, so I won't describe them in great detail, but I'll just kind of give you the once over. Uh, the first one that I want to reference is uh, at the, the Reagan Library debate, Brian Williams, the, the partisan hack from NBC who was moderating the thing. Uh, he asked a question of Rick Perry, Texas Governor Rick Perry, about uh, the high number of executions they have higher than other states anyway. Uh, I think it was up to 234 executions at the time of the debate. It's 235 now. Someone got executed a couple days ago, I think. But anyway, Williams asked Perry a question on that, and Williams could no sooner get the question out than the crowd raucously cheered. And Perry answered the question, and Williams made a comment about the crowd cheering, and Perry, to his credit, basically said that they understand that Texas uh, takes crime seriously. As well, they should. And, of course, the media castigated the Republicans for that and castigated the right for that. Saying, You're cheering executions. And then there was another situation last night uh, when Ron Paul was asked a question about a hypothetical situation of the 30-year-old person who uh, chose not to purchase uh, health insurance. And then he got in some sort of health issue and Blitzer was trying to ask the question, well, what should happen? You know, should he die? And before Paul could answer the question, a couple of people in the crowd said, yes. Now it wasn't a whole crowd, there's a couple people within it. And of course that's been all over the media today, people just crowing about it and just, oh my god, I can't believe this is what the Republicans are. Well, I want to clear up a couple things about those, those two incidents. I was not at either debate, but I would tell you in all honesty that when both of those situations came up, I was watching both debates at home, when both of those situations came up, I was one of those people that was in my living room cheering, both of them. I agree with the crowd in both of those cases. So when the media and the Democrats are castigating those who, who, who provided those outbursts or, or uh, criticized uh, what was done and said by those crowds, in effect, they're criticizing me because I agree with them. And that's something that's a little bit hard for some people to take, maybe a little hard for some people to understand, so I at least want to try and explain it. For those of you who are on the left and, and are just completely appalled, at our reaction to those two incidents. First of all, in terms of the so-called execution cheer, when Governor Perry was asked about his executions and immediately the, the cheer came up from the gallery, a lot of people have said, oh, the Republicans are cheering death. No, we're cheering justice. We are cheering a legal system, at least down in Texas, that appears to get the job done. Now think about this for a second. This, 
we have been told all of our lives, many of us, that criminals need to be rehabilitated and they need to be re and they need to be understood and that you know criminals or their actions really aren't their fault, it's the fault of society. It's not really their fault. And that, you know, if we if we just approach this a little bit more intelligently and let the academics take over, that you know, we'll 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 approach crime in a much more intelligent way. Has that worked? Drive through your nearest inner city and tell me if that's worked. It did. I believe that we need to take a much more hardline approach on crime in this country. And why this, uh, this tidbit that Williams put out there about the number of executions, why that was so appealing to us, why it did elicit a cheer from those in attendance and from me on my own couch, was that it was one of the first times, as it was explained, it was one of the first times that I feel like the safety and the security of law-abiding citizens was finally placed at a greater level of importance, at a higher level of importance, than the mythical rehabilitation of criminals. You know, I'm sorry to tell you, criminals are not criminals because of society. Criminals are not criminals because of poverty. Criminals are criminals simply and strictly because of a lack of character. Period. And the number one job of our justice system or of uh, the, the legal system should be to protect law-abiding citizens from non-law-abiding citizens. If that means they're incarcerated, if that means you're six feet under, whatever. The job of the legal system should not be to rehabilitate criminals. It should be to put them in a position where they are no longer a threat to the rest of us. Whether that's incarceration or you know what, better yet, in a lot of cases, execution. So, yes, that's very appealing to a lot of us. I know that's surprising to some of you and, and maybe, you know, maybe a bit tough for some of you to swallow, but we're at a point in our society where we need to take criminal behavior very, very seriously, and on a large scale we have not. However, in Texas they have, and I think that's something we can all look towards. Secondly, talking about the uh, let him die moment from the Tea Party debate last night. Uh, again, the media, the left, are just completely appalled at the callousness. Oh my! How can you? How can you say society should let someone die? Let me tell you how we can say that society should allow someone to die in that case. First of all, it was a hypothetical situation anyway. But let's go ahead and discuss it. In the hypothetical situation that Wolf Blitzer set up, this was a 30-year-old person who was gainfully employed, who by his own choice opted not to purchase a health care plan on the assumption that someone would take care of him if something disastrous happened. Now, you're going to sit here and tell me that someone like that should have their life spared? And more to the point that somehow society should be held responsible, the government should be held responsible, and by extension, my taxpayer money should be used to keep him alive? Bullshit. Now, I know that sounds callous, and, and in reality, I don't think a guy in that situation would actually die. I think if we did have the government completely out of health care the way that they should be, completely divorced from it, I do think that you would see faith-based organizations, charitable organizations, the philanthropic community come in and fill that void, you know, the way that they did before we got into all this Medicare and all these entitlements. As I said in the previous presentation, this country spent 150 years without all that crap, and we did pretty well. I kind of prefer, in some ways, the way life was then as opposed to what it is now. So, the bottom line of all of this is that the left and the media are trying to use that situation as a way to guilt people and to paying for the bad decisions of others. And I understand why they're doing it, because largely it's worked in American history, and, and certainly for the 20th century it did. You know, every time anyone would even look cross-eyed at Social Security or Medicare or any other social program, you know, here would come a Democrat or, or some news media coming out with uh, some sob story of someone who's going to be affected if, if some program gets cut off. And all they had to do was wheel a, wheel a little child with the, the, the doe eyes in front of the camera or, or some senior citizen wheel them in front of the camera. And Republicans back in those days, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you know what, they'd pretty much back off. And they say, all right, we can't really do it. But what we're seeing, 
And I think what the media is overlooking is that there is a new breed of conservative out there. There is a new breed of Republican out there. I would consider myself one of these people. It's not the Republican who's 50 and 60 and 70 years old. It's not the old ones. Certainly not the establishment of Republicans. I don't even think it's all Tea Partiers. But I think there's a younger breed of Republican, roughly 40 years of age and under. People like me, I fit into that age range. And we're people who have grown up entirely in a time period where we were told that the law-abiding citizens, the people that make good decisions for themselves, should cut a little slack to those who don't abide by the law, should cut a little slack to those who do not choose to make good decisions with their lives, cut a little slack to those people and help them out a little bit, and they'll eventually they'll be just like you. But yet we're looking through our lives and we see that that didn't happen. We were told to give deference to the criminals in this society, but yet crime is as bad as it's ever been. We were told that, you know, these poor people that don't have health care, shucks. It's just unfair and it's not their fault. All the while we're being told to pony up more money for them when we're having a hard time meeting the basic needs of our own families. You see, it all comes down to personal responsibility. And frankly, people of my generation are sick and fucking tired of being told that even though we are personally responsible and taking care of our own affairs, that that's not good enough and that somehow we have to now pony up and pay for those of you out there who are not taking care of your own affairs. To hell with you! We of this generation are finally at the point to, to where we are able to say, you know what? F you! Not that we want people to die, but by golly, if it's if it's by your own hand, fine. Don't hold us hostage about it. Everybody in, in Washington wants to talk about who's holding who hostage. I'll tell you who's holding the, the working American people, not the unions, the real working American people hostage. It's the poor and the criminal and the irresponsible. Those are the ones that are holding us hostage. And it's our generation who's saying, enough! No more. Not one more dime. And while I don't want to be the type of person that comes out here and says, I hope so-and-so dies, I would never say that. But I would say, if you have made irresponsible decisions, whether we're talking in a criminal sense or in a personal sense, then frankly, whatever happens to you happens. We don't believe, at least a lot of us, we don't believe that it's the government's prerogative to make up for the bad decisions of others. When you eliminate risk from life, you also eliminate responsibility. For the last 75 years, the government has gone down the road of trying to eliminate as much risk as they can, particularly for the most irresponsible of American citizens. The result has been that those irresponsible people have behaved even more irresponsibly. And we, the responsible, are sick and tired of footing the bill for it. So it's as tough as it might be to say in some senses, and as much as maybe previous generations of conservatives might never have said it, and previous generations of Republicans might never have said it, and it might even horrify them to hear it, I, and others in my age range, will come out and say it. Go to hell! You're going to live irresponsibly? Not off my dime. Good luck to you. The government shouldn't prop you up. I shouldn't prop you up. And I hope you find a comfortable gutter to go pass out in. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.